And so doing this work helps me save myself. And that's part of my calling into the work. When I met my husband, um, I was a minister already. And my real desire in a partner was to have fun. And so I never wanted to marry this guy. I just wanted to have lots and lots of fun. And so we did, and then we did get married. But we never talked about our family tree and our roots and the mental health in them. And that's another space where we're really missing out. When we think about children, families, and youth, we have neglected the care of their families, the adults, those who nurture the children. And so one opportunity we have here is when you're working with people who are creating families, to break the silence about mental illness, help people look at their own histories of mental health and how that might shape their home life. And so Blessed Union is a book I wrote when I realized that my husband and I, while we were dating, we were masking really hard. And it wasn't until after we were married that we learned that his father died of uh, colon cancer but was um, an active alcoholic and would um, drink until he passed out every night, that he has depression and anxiety on his side of the family. And then with my side of the family, depression, bipolar, and anxiety. So we create a family with these histories of mental health. And it was never discussed. We did, hey, we did premarital counseling. Don't you know, like, that's supposed to be the thing that makes sure you're, like, set up for success? How many of you, whether you do premarital counseling or you received it, had that invitation to unmask and talk about mental health some of you did. Well, we can do more of that. We can do more of that. So, um, you know, part of my ministry is really to create resources. And so today, the resource to highlight is the Blessed Youth Breaking the Silence About Mental Illness with Children and Teens. So this book came out during the pandemic, and the U.S. Surgeon General had just issued a huge crisis alert. It's an all hands on deck. He said, the data is showing us alarming rates, the highest rates of reported depression, anxiety, all time high, and increasing suicide rates for young people, and increased suicide in children, children of color, and young girls, increasing rates of suicide. And the most vulnerable for suicide in our youth are transgender, LGBTQ. And it's not because mental health and the challenges are caused by being transgender, no. The, the depression and suicide comes from society's discrimination and the trauma and abuse and the bullying is what's causing the crisis with our trans youth. And so during the pandemic, our family lost a loved one. I am a suicide loss survivor. And so you would think in a family like mine, I'd written these books, Blessed Are the Crazy Had Been Out, Blessed Union. Um, in my family where there's generations of bipolar and depression, we're trying to look out for the kids, you know, and check in, is so-and-so okay, is so-and-so okay? Well, my niece was the healthy one. Do you all do that too in your families? There's the troubled ones you're always worried about, and then those you don't worry about, like, oh yeah, they're good. Like, what do they do now? Like, what award? <laughs> you know, what honors? What? So that was my niece, Sydney. Uh, incredible, like the favorite, really. The favorite cousin, my son adored her. Um, we would call her to get advice on Breath of the Wild, like Legend of Zelda, it's a video game. And uh, looking back, you kind of say, like, oh, that was a sign. Looking back, when we talked to her, she loved the game. It's like, well, why do you love this game so much? And she said, I can go in there and be in there forever. And I can escape. And that was where she felt free in that game. And how many of our kids are finding that freedom? And I'm not labeling that as bad. But what if they could come and find that freedom with us? What would that look like in your context? 
what if our children and teens were free in our spaces, in our communities? She was not. And so I stand here and lament the lack of freedom so many children and youth experience in our faith communities, in our institutions, and how deadly that is. She was part of a Methodist tradition, and her confirmation class was with a Methodist church in Florida. And so she was taught that homosexuality was a sin by her youth minister. And she was baptized again. I baptized her the first time, and it worked. But this church had her be baptized again into this kind of church. And so as she grew and became who God made her to be, the day after she died, her brother told me she hated the church. I know. I do too. A church that would condemn and judge, shame and stigmatize people who are made in God's image and so hungry for affirmation and love. Why are we so stingy with love? Are we afraid we're going to run out? God's love is eternal and limitless and boundaryless. Let's pour it on to the kids and the youth, no matter what identities, no matter what cultures or life experiences or family of origin. Oh my gosh, let's pour into them this love. And so when we got the call that Sydney died, our hearts shattered, shattered into a million pieces. When she died, she had her laptop open. It was in the fall of 2020, the day before the election in 2020. And she was terrified about the election. Another term. And her grades on her laptop she had failed an exam. She was a straight A student, taking six AP honors classes. She was trying to get the hell out of high school. It was not an affirming space. She was trying to graduate early so she could survive. She had advocated for herself. She wrote letters to the principal saying, this is in the spring of the pandemic in 2020, she wrote a letter to the principal saying, this is not realistic, folks, to expect us to keep our 4.0s under these conditions. Could you go to pass-fail? Would you? No response to her letter. She called the school social worker once, twice, three times, leaving voice messages. No response. So this is the, the lives our kids lead. And if we're lucky enough for them to show up into our faith communities, how can we create a balm that is free of perfectionism and expectations of performance and perfectionism, free of judgment, a space where they could say, I'm not OK. Because the reason why those youth told me they did not feel free to tell the adults the truth, the reason they told me, they said, we grew up in this church. Well, you would think that would like be a plus, right? They said, we grew up here. When the adults look at us, they see us like we're little kids. And they expect us to still be happy and to smile. They don't see us for who we are now. And how often we do that to children and teens when they are evolving and they are becoming. How do we expand the space for the evolution and becoming, the transitioning 
of our children and youth.